Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which we are all dialing in from. We pay respect to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the academy and the profession. As a community of evaluators, we are privileged to work and learn every day with Indigenous colleagues and partners. Now, throughout this presentation, we will wanting to encourage people to pop their comments and questions onto the chat box. Um, and our colleague, um, and so, and John uh, will be moderating these questions and we'll have a chance to discuss them at the end of the presentation. So, you know, feel free to be using the chat box um, if, if there are any questions that are coming up along the way. So today we'll be discussing research on evaluation and we'll be hearing from a panel of speakers which I have the privilege of introducing. So uh, firstly, we'll be hearing from a speaker who is a familiar face to many of us, Dr. Ruth Aston, uh, hailing from New Zealand and now a senior lecturer at the Assessment and Evaluation Research Center here at the University of Melbourne. Ruth has a deep expertise has deep expertise in the areas of public health and health services research, educational evaluation, and health promotion in schools, with a specialization in program evaluation. She is currently working on several evaluations um, of, evaluate, of educational initiatives in Victoria and the Northern Territory, and the evaluation of the WIC Health Local Government Partnerships with over 30 local councils in Victoria. She holds an honorary fellow position at the Centre for Adolescent Health at Murdoch Children's Research Institute. We'll then get to hear from three brilliant emerging evaluators uh, who come from varied background, but are all keen scholars of evaluation and in fact are now completing their Masters of Evaluation with us. So firstly, we'll hear from Kat Franks from a back who has a background in business operations, developing grant programs, managing research centers and client service. And she has a back and experience working in government funded organizations, non-government sectors, including academic research, consultancy and design. And she's currently working in evaluation at an agency uh, in government. Then we get to hear from Hannah Morgan, who is a qualified social worker with experience in mental health, disability, and LGBTIQ plus health. Most recently, she has worked in, uh, in project management, coordinating national projects focused on LGBTIQ plus health and palliative care research. And she's currently working as an evaluator at the Black Dog Institute. Uh, this is Australia's only medical research institute investigating mental health across the lifespan. And last but definitely not least, we'll uh, hear from Stephanie White, who come to evaluation after years working in education research policy and practice in the government and non-government sectors. She's led projects in early childhood education, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander education, student engagement, school improvement, and most recently student well-being. Stephanie is a senior evaluation officer at the Victorian Department of Education. So without much further ado, please welcome Dr. Ruth Aston. Thank you, Katina. And um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, I'm just thrilled to, to have the opportunity to present uh, to our AES members, but also as, as part of this incredible team. Um, just the next slide, please, Kat. So what we wanted to do was sort of to start with a little bit of context about the review project um, before you hear from each of our speakers about their particular areas of uh, interest as part of this review. So we are conducting this review because the last known published review of research on evaluation uh, was published in 2017, but included research that was uh, essentially available um, up until the date of 2014. So it had been some time uh, since that review uh, was conducted. Um, but what Corin et al, so this is Chris Corin from the West, University of Western Michigan, what he found with his colleagues is that over the, that decade of 2005 to 2014, there were 257 research on evaluation studies published. And what uh, Chris and his colleagues were most concerned about was the limited research available at that time on valuing and evaluation, ethics, and the use of evaluation. They and we reflected that since that review was conducted, there has been a growing interest in many areas of evaluation, including but not limited to participatory evaluation, co-design, and the relationship between policy and program design and evaluation practice. 
So therefore we felt uh, that synthesizing research on evaluation is really important to make sure that all available evidence is being collated and summarized and ideally appraised on a fairly regular basis. It also allows us to see where we are at in terms of the knowledge that we have about uh, our field of evaluation and evaluation practice, and importantly, identify where there are gaps and what priorities we have for future research on evaluation. So the next slide, please. So before we go any further, we just wanted to sort of clarify how we have referred to research on evaluation for the purposes of a systematic review. And in large part, we've inherited this definition. So the definition you can see on the slide there is, um, was defined by Chris Curran and his colleagues, where research on evaluation is any purposeful, systematic, empirical inquiry intended to create a strong evidence base and infrastructure for the applied practice of evaluation. So at this point, I want to note that um, while empirical inquiry was the focus of our review, we recognize that there are many other types of inquiry that are as important to add, add, adding to our evidence base and infrastructure for applied practice of evaluation. So just noting that it's a lot broader than just empirical inquiry, but that was the focus of this review. And next slide, please, Ed. Thank you. So holding that definition in the, the broad context in mind, the objectives of this systematic review were to replicate Corrin's et al's uh, original review with some modifications, focusing on all research on evaluation that's been published from 2015 to 2019. We had the purpose of understanding what research has been conducted, where there may be gaps, particularly whether the gaps that currently identified, are they still gaps, are they existing? Um, so that we can actually develop an agenda for future research on evaluation. What are our priorities? What do we need to be doing research on based on the practice sort of advancements of our profession? At this point, it's worth acknowledging and certainly important to recognize that this review is being led by Dr. Wanza. So this is Dana Wanza. Um, she's an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Scout. And although she was very keen to hear that we were presenting to you, she didn't quite want to get up at 3 a.m. To, to, to join us. So she's here in spirit, um, but we do acknowledge that, that this work has been led by her. And we at the University of Melbourne are collaborating with her on this project. And as part of that, our part of the pie, if you like, or our part of the, the work was to look at three evaluation journals uh, with a, a, a total of 782 journal articles being included in our portion of the review. So what did we do? We screened all the articles, so all the 782 articles that I mentioned before, based on Corrin's uh, systematic review procedures with some minor amendments. So we were looking at all 782 articles. They were all published in that publication period I mentioned, all in English. They were published in one of 14 uh, journals on evaluation, including the Evaluation Journal of Australasia. And to be included in the review, the articles needed to demonstrate that they were purposeful, systematic, empirical, and were generating knowledge about evaluation, as I mentioned before. So essentially meeting that definition of research on evaluation. Uh, and they also needed to include enough information for us to code them as part of the review. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, while we were really interested in the systematic review procedures, we weren't sure how much interest they would, they would hold for you all. So I might be brief here and perhaps touch on a few key points. Um, as you can see, we, there's a team of us uh, and research on evaluation is, we learned as we went through this process, although we, we had some foresight that this might occur, that there was quite a lot of uh, essentially disagreement between us whether, whether something was, whether an article was actually meeting that definition of research on evaluation. So we undertook quite extensive calibration processes and we found with the US team that they were doing the same thing. So that was a bit of a relief, um, but we did reach an acceptable level of consensus for all 782 articles on title and abstract as to whether they met the definition of ROE. And we were looking at articles in evaluation and program planning, the Evaluation Journal of Australasia, as I mentioned, and New Directions for Evaluation. Um, slide please, Kat. 
So once the articles had met that initial inclusion criteria, so that list of four or five that I mentioned before, we then went through a coding process using Mal Marks uh, coding framework, which class, it's essentially a tool to classify research on evaluation as um, in terms of what the subject of the inquiry is and what the mode of the inquiry is, as you can see on this, the screen here. Again, touching on this, this, this step was again quite challenging to reach consensus on, so we had to lower our benchmark there, and we did reach 66%, which again was, was relatively similar to what the US team was able to reach. Um, and you can see a little bit about our process there, but just for clarification, once uh, an article met that initial uh, inclusion criteria, i.e. was it could it be classified as research on evaluation? We then identify what was the subject of the inquiry and what was the mode of the inquiry. And the US team are doing the exact same thing with the remaining uh, 11 journals. Okay, now I apologize if you might need to zoom in, but I'm gonna, this is essentially the results of our review before I hand over to Kat. Um, we're in the red box, so the first three journals there, Evaluation and Program Planning, New Directions for Evaluation and EJA. And there's a couple of observations I wanted to offer before um, I hand over to the next speaker. So across the three journals that we reviewed, between 22 and 38%, so again, that's that 782 figure that we screened, um, between 38% of those actually met the inclusion criteria for ROE if we look at EJA. So it's one of three, but it's quite it's quite amazing. I was quite happy to see that that um, the Australasian Journal is proportionately contributing quite a high degree of research on evaluation to the evidence base. Um, unsurprisingly, so this is where we've re essentially reaffirmed uh, the the original reviews findings. The majority of ROE studies were about evaluation practice, so the activities of doing evaluation. Um, a lot of it was about methods, synthesis procedures, and so forth. This was closely followed by evaluation consequences um, and domain-specific uh, ROE, which could be things like looking at ideal evaluation capacity building programs for certain groups of, of students, or it could be um, an organization-specific evaluation framework, it could be a tool for a discipline, and so forth. Uh, in terms of modes of inquiry, again, the patterns that we see here are like, almost identical to what our own uh, Utah review found. The overwhelming majority of ROE studies are descriptive, um, follow, followed closely by development tools and models. So in evaluation, that's often the development of rubrics, um, framework development, so articles that talk specifically about developing evaluation frameworks and the processes of doing that um, would fall into that category as well. So if we come back to the 782 articles that we reviewed, 190 of them were identified as research on evaluation. That's approximately 25%, so a quarter, quarter of all the studies that we reviewed were research. And in terms of EJA in particular, this is a huge increase since uh, the previous review. So thinking about when the previous review ended in 2014 to where this review uh, began in 2015 to 2019, uh, Quirin et al's review found only six ROE studies in EJA over that decade period they covered, and we identified 30 in that five-year period alone. So there is an exponential increase, and some of the other journals represent a similar, similar growth, um, which we think is really positive. And while our colleagues in the US are still continuing to screen their articles, you can see some numbers in the table above that reflect what they are finding. And on brief glance, it's a relatively similar trend based on the subjects of inquiry and the modes of inquiry. It's relatively consistent across the journals. Um, and, and that's quite reaffirming again that what we found in, in Coronet Charles review that decade, we're seeing again, but there's more research on evaluation that's being generated. Uh, relative to what there was uh, in the previous decade. So I'm now going to hand over to Kat, who's going to share her findings on the use of evaluation in the government. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, so my research focuses on empirical ROE literature from 2005 to 2019 on the use of evaluation findings within government. I explored ROE studies through the evaluation use framework of instrumental, conceptual, and symbolic use. For those unfamiliar with these terms, 
Instrumental use is the direct use of evaluation recommendations or findings to inform decision making for change, for action or change. Conceptual use is when findings do not lead to action or change, but results in users having a better understanding about the program or policy that improves their knowledge or attitude about the program or policy. Symbolic use, also known as political use, is when findings are used to legitimize an existing position or support a decision already made, or when evaluation findings are used for political self-interest. Outside the scope of this review was process use. This is found when behavioral changes are seen within those directly involved in the evaluation as a result of being part of the process of evaluation. Research in this area is mainly focused on evaluation capacity building, which could have been a whole capstone project in itself. The second part of my research examined whether the literature addressed influencing factors of findings use and the alignment to the Johnson and Co framework shown here, which is based on an ROE literature review of evaluation use articles from 1986 to 2005. They found 41 articles, which builds on the Cousins and Leithwood's 1986 framework of 12 factors. This framework categorizes factors under evaluation implementation, decisional policy setting and stakeholder involvement. This was the search methodology, which I won't go into detail. I will note that I incorporated the ROE articles from Corrin's review, which is why my time frame is from 2005. After completing this process, my sample was 14 papers. I'll also quickly note the limitations. The review was conducted within the parameters of the ROE systematic review. As such, this doesn't include publications outside the evaluation journals and exclude studies from 2020 onwards. I hope to continue building on this review and capture additional publications on this topic in the future. The next two slides provide a brief overview of the findings. The icons show whether a study investigated a findings use category and whether they address use factors. As you can see, a range of findings use was studied with many addressing instrumental, conceptual and symbolic use. In addition to other use categories such as strategic use, which is when high level decision makers use evaluation findings, such as a decision in a spending review, as an example. The settings for the studies varied from federal to state government departments and agencies to parliament, legislative offices to the European Commission. The majority of findings use studies investigated instrumental use, the most common form of use at a programmatic level, with all findings evidence of use that informed decision making to change a policy or program, which is positive. However, the studies were mostly conducted in European nations and North America. Influencing factors were examined in almost all of the articles with eight articles studying influencing factors aligned to the Johnson & Co framework. The most dominant category study was evaluation implementation, followed by the decision and policy setting category with two novel factors of evaluation policy and organizational capacity to use evaluation explored. Stakeholder involvement was the category least examined. In an Australian study by Maloney, stakeholder involvement was a frequently mentioned influencing factor for use, with Van Lanningham examining stakeholder strategies used by internal legislative evaluators across two articles. Otherwise, it was generally an unexplored category. What I took away from this was that the factors that enable the use of evaluation findings is complex, which I'm sure some of you will know. The most common factors explored include evaluation quality, findings, the information needs of the evaluation audience and the political climate. I'll briefly take you through one of the studies that addresses these factors. With this researcher, Liederman, taking a different approach, calling for a move away from the findings, the most, the finding, the most important factor for use. This study looks at the context specific necessary conditions required for users of, eva of external evaluation findings to make a decision to change a program. A qualitative comparative analysis of 11 program project evaluations within the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation was performed. The relationship between context conditions, so the pressure for change and the level of conflict and the actor conditions, so the novelty of value, the novelty value of findings and the evaluation quality were examined to test four hypotheses. Whether the evaluation acted as a conciliator, an awakener or a referee or a trigger for a change decision. 
The 11 cases were scattered across the evaluation context and actor conditions with instrumental use evident in six cases. So the awakener. In a low pressure and low conflict environment, it is expected that an evaluation can cause a change decision by awakening people, as long as the findings reveal something new and are of good quality. This assumption was generally accepted. The trigger. Where there is pressure for change and low conflict, it is assumed the evaluation triggers change if it is good quality with novelty less of an issue. This was, evident, this was evidence that supported this assumption. The referee. In a high pressure environment where stakeholders are in conflict, neither evaluation quality nor novelty is necessarily for utility with findings accepted by only one st set of stakeholders. The hypothesis was not accepted and revised to an endorser where evaluation quality and novelty are independent factors. That alone are not necessary. The conciliator. During conflicts where there is a lack of awareness of change, substantial decisions are made when evaluation are of high quality and novel, but this is rare. Change decisions were not made in two cases displaying these conditions. As such, the researcher was unable to test. Studies such as this increase my awareness about the particular context related conditions, which are outside the control of an evaluator conducting an evaluation within a government setting. From the studies led in Canada by Borges, these looked at the usability of evaluation reports to know whether the precursors for evaluation use, report credibility and quality were present. In addition to examining whether program evaluation findings were strategically utilized in spending reviews within two federal government agencies, it also looked at the application of findings to ongoing program design and delivery improvements. It found that the evaluation reports were credible with evaluation quality demonstrated through clear evaluation questions, the integration of stakeholders through the evaluation process and sound methods used to produce the findings. The reports provided useful information with relevant, appropriate and actionable recommendations, which could lead to implementation and instrumental use of findings. However, while these factors should support utility, the evaluation findings were not used to make decisions and spending reviews, so no strategic use. This was likely due to the requirements of the Canadian 2009 policy on evaluation. With the evaluations not meeting the information needs of high level decision makers, the timeliness of the reports and a program level focus. However, this, this level of focus did result in mostly instrumental use of findings for program improvement with some instances of conceptual use. This study may be considered the different uses of evaluation findings with the government and how an evaluation policy can enable and also impede use. I was also unaware of Canada's evaluative system within government that includes the requirements to make evaluation reports publicly available, along with management response to action plans that address evaluation recommendations. Canada certainly looks to be more advanced in Australia in relation to the level of evaluations conducted and the use of findings and the transparency. However, for all the evaluation reports published, there were still very few ROE studies in this area. So it's hard to say what evaluation use looks like in government agencies and departments in Australia through the ROE in this sample, as I only found one Australian study published by Jade Maloney in 2017 in the Evaluation Journal of Australasia. Apologies if I missed any other Australian studies, but this article focuses on AES members' perceptions on the levels of evaluation use, the factors affecting utility, and how well evaluators overcome barriers to use in practice. Respondents in this study rated the non-use of evaluation findings by government agencies in Australia as a considerable problem. However, many had participated in an evaluation which resulted in the findings being used mostly for accountability purposes when asked to recount their most recent case of evaluation use. Demand size factors, especially agency leadership commitment and individual openness to evaluation and supply side factors mainly stakeholder involvement in establishing the real purpose of the evaluation and effective communication of findings were viewed as important factors to support use. If you haven't already read this article, I highly recommend. In closing, I hope to build on this review and potentially expand beyond evaluation journals, as I'm interested to know whether there is research out there that looks at federal or state government policymakers and program managers' perspectives on the use of findings within government agencies and departments. Or if anyone is interested in being part of a study that looks at this, please reach out. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Hannah. Thanks, Kat. 
Just give me one moment. Okay. Well, I am zooming in from Gadigal land and I'm really pleased to be here to hopefully consolidate um, in 10 minutes <laughs> what was quite a, a journey of deep diving into research on evaluation that met the criteria for values inquiry. Next slide, please. So I, foc I wanted to focus on this area, as you heard earlier in this presentation, this was one of the under-researched areas. In Corin and colleagues' review, only 3.5% of papers on research on evaluation um, were coded as being values inquiry. And as a new evaluator, I thought, oh, it'd be really interesting to see what I could learn um, from the various opinions of stakeholders and evaluators in my own professional practice. So first of all, I wanted to define what we mean by values inquiry. And using Mark's definition, Mark defines values inquiry as identifying value positions of stakeholders and public evaluation methods used to probe the values embedded in and related to a program. So essentially, I was looking for research on evaluation that included the opinions, attitudes, beliefs and values of stakeholder groups and evaluators. Next slide, please. So what values inquiry research on evaluation in um, was completed between 2015 to 19? Well, I can say that um, there were 20 articles in total. Interestingly, the articles that our team coded, um, they seem to have, I guess we coded more articles and I don't know if there was some um, differences in approach across the teams. Um, but yeah, I think it's also interesting to note there were for journals that didn't include any values inquiry research on evaluation. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So I completed a thematic analysis on the literature. And while values inquiry was diverse in subject matter, I did find, and maybe it was my social work background, but there was an overarching repeating theme around power. And I found it really interesting because there was lots of opinions and perspectives around how power is distributed or not distributed and the consequences this can have on evaluation framing, processes, outcomes and use. So I found that power was explored across different contexts. The, a cultural context, um, mostly around Australia and New Zealand, evaluation and political context, program evaluation, but specifically participatory approaches. And as well as that, there was uh, articles that were about the evaluation profession. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you I guess a short summary on um, some of what I found as well as the implications for practice. I know for myself, I'm always thinking about, so what does this mean for me in the field? Um, so here's a little bit of a summary across those different areas. So four articles discussed evaluation and cultural context, highlighting the ways in which evaluations mainly reflect Western understandings of the world and Western perspectives of merit and worth. And so in terms of implications for practice, there's a need to understand the benefits of practicing in a in an, a culturally appropriate way, being reflexive as an evaluator, having awareness of cultural bias and challenging theories that underpin program designs. And really thinking about our position in relation to the evaluation, considering the history of colonization, acknowledging indigenous knowledge systems, and thinking about how we're doing this in practice and if we are being culturally appropriate in the way that we work. Next slide, please. Uh, 
really interesting. Um, I found this area um, and following on a little bit from Kat and some of the discussions raised, but um, there were discussions around the political context. So multiple papers discussed the power that government and administrators have in influencing the way evaluations are conducted, how outcomes are determined and evaluation use. So um, Evans et al reported there was a high reliance on funding bodies in determining outcomes, sometimes less reliance on evidence-based sources such as literature reviews, and a small survey of 63 Australian evaluators found that evaluators employed in medium and small organisations said funding bodies were influential in the choice of evaluation design. And so it's this discussion around how evaluation can feel politicised and constrained and that sometimes, and I'm sure we've all experienced um, the idea of walking into an evaluation, evaluation there's predetermined outcomes. Um, I think we can relate to that. So in terms of practice implications, Evans proposed that there were a range of practical actions that include adopting a values-based agenda, asking stakeholders what outcomes are most important to them and taking action to defend evaluation of different outcomes that really go beyond the range of short-term outcomes prioritised in fiscal and social policy. Next slide, please. At the program level, and I was really pleased to see this because I've done like quite a lot of co-design um, in my project management um, work and I'm really interested in participatory evaluation um, and appreciate that there's always power struggles in those spaces. Well there often is anyway and um, so studies highlighted a range of different considerations including how they can be different agendas between program implementers and those people who are engaged to um, work in a participatory way and those who are essentially the people who are meant to benefit from the program. And it spoke about how there's often a political interest um, that influences how, the, I guess, the extent to which participatory evaluation can happen. There was one um, single factor in experiment by Fronick and Roman, and this was so interesting because it really sh um, showed in this case that it can evaluation use is higher when um, you don't use a participatory approach when compared to when you use a participatory approach, but you do it in an inauthentic way. And I think that would ring true for most of us here um, who've participated in um, participatory um, engagements and it hasn't felt like your contribution has really been taken into consideration. So I think this is, could be a really interesting area of future research. And um, next slide, please. And a little bit separate, but still connected to all of this is discussions around the evaluation profession. And mostly it was about the progression of the profession and getting evaluators views on how we should progress, whether it's through certification, credentialing, um, looking at competencies. And while there wasn't a clear consensus on what could be pursued, there were concerns raised about the potential obstacles that could be cre created um, through the professionalization of evaluation field. And so it was discussions around for who um, would this benefit, why and in what conditions, who would be best served by um, decisions that might be made around professionalization. And I guess for me, it made me think about how values inquiry views um, and findings from the research are probably quite important when thinking about the progression of evaluation as a discipline. Next slide, please. So the research to me has shown that there's a need to think about the way that power manifests across all levels of evaluation and I think values inquiry research could assist us in this thinking. And while these findings can't necessarily 
been neatly synthesized because there were diverse um, subject matter um, covered in the articles and articles that weren't included um, within this broader theme. I think that um, certainly there could be a need to interrogate um, some of these areas further with more research. And I think there could be a link between values inquiry research and how we might capture that and capture that information, synthesize it and integrate it into conversations about the evaluation profession. Next slide, please. So what were some of my key takeaways? They're still happening as I reflect on this topic. Um, certainly it was a challenge in synthesizing um, these articles because it was diverse content. But I think values inquiry can tell us useful information about how we do evaluation and who and who we want to be as a profession and where we want to go. It helps illuminate, uh, illuminate and give voice to some of the complexity we face when working in the field. Uh, there were so many times I read these research articles and I felt really validated and seen. Um, but essentially, this is not the only space we can find that validation and find this really important context, content, that there's also non-empirical research that provides a significant contribution to these discussions as well. And it was challenging for me sometimes to not include research papers that I thought would, you know, were making really important points around values and values inquiry and evaluation. And that's all from me. Thanks. I'll hand over to Steph. Thanks so much, Hannah. And I'll try not to rehash too many uh, similar reflections um, over the next 10 minutes. Um, so my nested literature review was on professional ethics in evaluation, and I drew on three common definitions of ethics for this. The principles of morality, the rules for a profession, and the study of ideal human behaviour. As an emerging evaluator, like uh, Kat and Hannah, I was really keen to explore how research on evaluation is building our understanding of evaluation ethics and what this means for practitioners. I think when, when I've been thinking about evaluation and practicing, there's it's like there's lots of components that on their own seem feel fairly straightforward, but then when you bring it all together, there's the there's context, stakeholders, values, politics, et cetera, et cetera. All of that messiness can sometimes lead to ethical dilemmas. And, you know, despite an acknowledgement of the ethical dilemmas that evaluators face and that and evaluation ethics being, um, my apologies, ethics being considered important for the field of evaluation, the research on it over the years has been fairly patchy. So I'll briefly talk through the nature of my review, the gaps um, and implications I've identified and finish off with a brief, hopefully not too rehashed reflection <laughs> on patterns. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. So my intention through the literature review was to focus on literature that really explicitly framed, was really explicitly framed in terms of evaluation ethics. So it was quite, um, it was quite narrow in its scope. And I was looking at, yeah, I, I had three focuses through the through the review. I looked at how the study framed ethics in terms of those three relevant definitions I mentioned previously. I then looked at how the research sought to progress our understanding um, through contributing, testing, or generating new knowledge. And then using the AES guidelines as a proxy for the needs of practitioners, considered what the implications were for practitioners at different stages of the evaluation process. So what did I find? Thanks, Kat. Uh, honestly, not, not much within the inclusion criteria I set for my review, but at the same time found quite a lot. So this is a map of the findings from the five articles that were identified. And so in terms of framing of evaluation ethics, there was some mention of this study of ideal human behaviour and um, it generally referred to previous studies rather than being the, the focus of the um, paper itself. Uh, so ethics was generally 
framed in terms of the principles that, that underpin the rules of the profession. So, for example, following mandated ethics review processes is important from the perspective of not doing harm to participants. In terms of how the research contributed to our understanding of evaluation ethics, the articles exclusively contributed to existing knowledge. So they built on previous research findings, which isn't, I mean, this is common in research, right? Um, I suppose just in terms of, you know, pushing the, the limits of our understanding of evaluation ethics in terms of generating new knowledge and testing hypotheses and things like that was uh, less of a feature. Uh, but in contributing to the existing knowledge base, they did so through exploring the ideas in local, localised and contextualised ways. So one example of that was uh, Pledger and colleagues took four previous studies about pressure on evaluators uh, that were in different countries and then elevated that for a, a country comparison of pressure on evaluators. In terms of the needs of practitioners, again, there was some reference to the studies that, to previous studies that looked at the entry and contracting stage of evaluation, but they really sharply focused on the conduct and reporting stages of the evaluation. So, for example, uh, Naden and colleagues looked at uh, the, the development of a capacity to consent protocol for youth mental health evaluation, where parental consent was the norm in that jurisdiction, but was a challenge for their evaluation context. Interestingly, though, these articles through the, in, on the conduct and reporting um, focus did tend to sort of um, mention the entry contracting stage. This is something that we know through other literature that it's a really important um, stage in the evaluation. So really alluding to the opportunity for further research there. Looking at this little visual, it's pretty clear that there's some gaps, but it is only five articles. And as I said, my literature review was quite narrow in scope. So there were some articles that didn't meet my inclusion criteria that absolutely have implications for uh, the ethical practice of evaluations. So, for example, Wehi Payana and McKeg, I think Hannah also has this listed in her slides as well, um, have a paper on evaluative thinking that talks about the ethical imperative to uphold various cultural ways of deliberating during an evaluation. I'm kind of heading into implications here, but I think the other thing I found quite interesting was the recent writing that sort of falls outside of research on evaluation or even the literature that we, we reviewed that is calling on research on evaluation to do uh, a bit more heavy lifting for professional ethics. So one key writer is Thomas Schwant and Schwant and Gates in evaluating and valuing, oh, that's not gonna work on the video, um, it, evaluating and valuing on social research. They call on ROE to address topics such, um, such as um, the efficacy of deliberations in evaluation and other types of emerging practices in evaluation. And there's another, more recent publication, I think, Practical Wisdom for an Ethical Evaluation Practice. Schwant has a chapter in there where he, and he calls on ROE to look at things like the um, practical wisdom as an, as a, an organizing framework for our professional practice. And, you know, perhaps ROE, ROE being able to look at enablers or barriers to that, that type of work in the field. Uh, also, you know, as, as has been mentioned already, there's, you know, current, current work, there's more, you know, these review, this review ended in the period was 2019 was the last sort of literature we were looking at. And just looking at the more, most recent, um, the most recent issue of Evaluation Journal of Australasia, there's definitely some articles in there about ethics and even the book review, Kylie Kingston's book review of a research agenda for evaluation, that's even calling, um, you know, talking about professional ethics. So certainly a lot, um, a lot going on. 
Thanks, Kat. So I've probably covered quite a few of these uh, implications already, but I suppose in terms of professional ethics, there was what I found through the literature review, but there's also all of these other topics that are being written on that absolutely have implications for our practice. And I think um, just through reading the literature and taking that the, the lens of ethics to the papers, there's a lot to learn. We're talking about methods, unintended consequences, evaluative thinking, et cetera, et cetera. But as I mentioned, you know, Schwant, Schwant and Gates, they're also calling on um, ROE to address some new topics as well. And as Hannah mentioned, empirical inquiry is just one type of inquiry. And I think, you know, ROE has its role to play, but there are other types of inquiry that will be really well suited to complement ROE, or that are well suited to complement ROE um, in building the evidence base for professional practice, um, ethical professional practice in evaluation. On a more personal note, um, this, this process has really helped me, this process of engaging with the literature has helped me to sit with my own ethics and sit with the messiness of evaluation. I think, you know, being able to see that experiences we have are reflected in others' experiences through the literature, I mean, it's certainly given me that opportunity to reflect and just I guess be cognizant of the values that I'm bringing to my practice. And sometimes if I feel a bit of tension or there's sort of tension in the room or however it manifests, um, being able to sit with that and, and unpack that. And just as there are many topics to still investigate with uh, um, ethics in evaluation practice, I have so many more questions. I'm a, an emerging evaluator. Um, and also really new to the research on evaluation literature. So loads of questions, but that is me, ethics in evaluation practice. There's some stuff out there and there's still a lot to do. And thank you, Katina. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, Kat, Hannah, and Steph for the tour de force of making this challenging, complex, and extremely important topic so interesting and relevant for us as practitioners. Um, as many of you might have heard, you know, it's it's a, a the, the team spent considerable time reflecting, discussing, um, debating, and uh, trying to reach consensus on this topic of ROE. And um, I, I think in reflecting on this uh, body of work, it seems to me that this research on evaluation should not only be the purview of the select few. I think if we as practitioners care about the profession and care about furthering the knowledge base uh, on which we can draw on um, on this body of work, then I think we need to pay careful attention to what gets added to this body of knowledge. Um, who is setting the agenda, for example, and, you know, what is getting prioritized? And, you know, the other important question to ask ourselves is, you know, are we willing to invest time um, into this into this important work? Um, now, I, I promise that we will set some time for, for questions and answers and, and, and discussions, but I just wanted to make this um, a call to action today um, and we're very keen as a team and we're, we're just a team of people who um, are interested in this topic came together and of course a uh, uh, part of that is fulfilling the capstone requirement but I think it's become so much more than that for all of us we've said that you know we're very keen to continue to work together and we're wanting to make this a call for action to you as well today and um, you know and we're wanting to invite more participation and uh, more involvement uh, from you and this is an opportunity I think as us, us as a community of practitioners can come together. So on the uh, chat box, I've put um, a, a very quick uh, two minute form for you to stay in touch with us if you're interested to have more conversations. And we can think about three ways for us to continue to, to, um, to engage, for you to engage with us. So if you would like to just be kept in the loop in terms of you know, the, the future developments of this project, where is it heading, what are some of the findings, and you're wanting to just stay in touch that way, then that's, that's great. Um, the other initiative that we're embarking on soon is around trying to get um, a, a sense, a better sense in the renewal of the needs assessment uh, in the Australasian um, 
context around what are the topics that will be relevant for us as practitioners in, in this ROE space and kind of the priorities that needs to be set. So that's kind of agenda setting. So if you like to be a participant, then for sure, let us know. And if even better, if you want to be part of that and part of, want to collaborate with us, then, you know, be, you're very, very welcome and we'd be very keen to hear from you. So uh, pop your name into the, into the form and then we'll be um, happy to, uh, to, to stay in touch. I think there are also opportunities, you know, we see that the work and the collaboration with University of Wisconsin Start as absolutely a, a strength to this collaboration. And, you know, we, we are talking about opportunities in the future to kind of make this uh, re a resource for us as practitioners, um, an, an open, you know, open access repository where people can access some of some of these works. So, um, so yes, please, you know, we're wanting this conversation to be ongoing and uh, we're wanting to definitely have more conversations. So we have about eight minutes now uh, for questions and answers. And, and um, thank you again, John, for facilitating that. And uh, I might pass the time to you to uh, field a few questions for us. Great. Thank you, Katina. And thank you to our uh, speakers. Um, we do have a few questions on the chat room. But um, before I get to those, um, I'll pose one question to all three speakers, but not to answer it straight away, but to think about it and, and um, perhaps and uh, towards the end. Uh, I suppose my question is, uh, and in part, I know that I think it was, um, I think it was Hannah who said that she likes to reflect on, so what, what does this mean? Um, Steph to get into the implications. So my question is, um, what are the, uh, what, are, what are the immediate or implications for the AES as a professional body? So I ask you in a few minutes, to come back with if there was if this if there was one standout implication about the AES as a professional organization, what might that be? But while you're thinking about that, I'll now get into the chat room. And I know Hannah has already responded to this first question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, that's from Karen, which is that um, Karen said that uh, the uh, the AES or the EGA had two special issues. Um, on the particular uh, topic of ROE, and the question is: Did you see and did you did you see similar concentration on the values topics in other journals? Now I know Hannah, you've responded and said, uh, I think in short, no. But did you want to elaborate on whether any differences across the journals that you saw in terms of the focus on values? Yeah. Um there, so with um, that question, um, there was the, the one special issue, uh, but I didn't see other special issues. And in terms of the different journals and their focus points, I haven't really done an analysis on how those different journals, um, you know, whether the content they discussed was similar or different. Um, in those in that way so I probably have to have another look at that to answer that question um, with confidence uh, but yeah thank you I suppose this, the second part of Karen's questions is similar lines but rather than uh, comparing um, across the journals again more the time horizon uh, have you did you notice any and you may, may not have been a specific area of study mm -hmm. But did you notice or have any sort of observations around whether there's been a shift across time in the focus or content regarding the journals on values? Mm. I didn't do um, an analysis on Corin et al's um, articles that they um, coded as values inquiry. And I, I didn't really look at the shifts over time. But when I went back and had a little scan of the time period we were covering, there wasn't anything that stood out. So the articles were sort of across all time periods covering, um, you know, different content. So you might get something in 2015 talking about participatory approaches, but then also in 2019, it comes up again. So I didn't see shifts in our time period, but I think it would be really interesting um, to go back and have a look at that because I imagine, particularly with things like participatory evaluation um, and the cultural context, those things I don't think would have perhaps come up as much in um, the previous review. Uh, thank you. Um, another next question is, um, uh, well, to, to Hannah and Steph, which is about the interchange of, have, 
uh, have people use the terms around ethics and values interchangeably? Um, and I'll, I'll add to that question, um, what's your take on uh, those two? What, um, what differentiates those two, two terms and where do they overlap? So first of all, have you did you see in the literature any confusion or interchangeability? But what's your both of your perspectives on the use of those two terms? I don't know who'd like to go first. Perhaps Hannah, uh, if you can go, then I'll ask Steph to yeah. follow up. Yeah, such a great question. So rarely, if ever, did I see ethics talked about explicitly. But when I think about the themes that I've raised today that came out of that collection of research articles, I think there are many ethical questions and implications to um, some of the discussions that were had. So um, I, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Steph and I spoke about this throughout our process. And um, yeah, I think that um, it, was, it was lacking, I think, that um, drawing that line um, particularly around, I was thinking about the the one study uh, with the participatory evaluation where, you know, you can think about the harms that could be caused if we don't do it in a way that is authentic. And for me, that brings up ethical questions. Steph, did you want to pick up on anything else? Thanks, Hannah. I yeah, can only echo that. I will admit that I really naively came into this um saying I said I think I said to someone I don't want to think about values I don't want to talk about values I don't want to talk about ethics and so this is definitely yeah still a learning um a learning journey for me I don't I yeah I I didn't read anything that alluded to the, the terms being used interchangeably but I think that the interrelationship between the two is is really important and I'm yeah still trying to unpick it myself so to that second question I'm not sure that I have um a, a very a, an answer that is articulate at all <laughs> at the moment. That, that's okay um Katina how much time do we have left because I'm I know there's a few questions there I might have to cherry pick uh how much time do we have left right okay um I think the speakers have are happy to stay on for another 10 minutes. Uh, but we, if we can take one more question and then uh, those who are happy to stay on uh, could, but we'll just wrap that up after the next, uh, after the next question. Okay, not a problem. Um, I might go to the question of gaps. I'm just scrolling back up now. There was a, where was here? Um, okay, this is from Santi Owen. Uh, are there any, what are the research gaps? So given that you've all undertaken this review of the different aspects of ROE, um, what do you see as the, um, the main, main gaps that you would like to see address? I um, don't know who would like to go first, but um, Kat or Seth or Hannah, from your perspective, what do you see to be the main gaps? Pat, do you want to go? Oh, sorry, I'm having technical. Just oh, to make sorry. <laughs> sorry, apologies if you saw my screen before. I didn't realise, so apologies if you did that. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, um, it, it, the tricky part was because we were looking at empirical research um, was we had to... <laughs> Um, exclude a lot of articles that I think are really important. And um, I think potentially for me in terms of the value space, um, some empirical research on values theory could be an area um, worth exploring further. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Steph and Kat, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I've, I'm just looking at my my Schwann and Gates book which has been I've been reading over and over and I think that idea of um, a lot of the research on ethics thus far has kind of fit within a particular way of evaluating and I think there are those opportunities you know even though the, the research is patchy anyway opportunities to sort of push our understanding a bit further and even um, 
even elevate to the level of the profession rather than just the sort of individual professional ethics. That that was my sort of takeaway from it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we don't run out of time because I know now we are over time, but uh, Christina said you know, speakers are happy to stay on for a little while longer. Um, if there was, from the work that you've done, um, do you see any immediate implications for what the AES should be doing as a body? Okay. Ruth? Yes, yes, and just um, drawing attention to, to Brad's sort of reflections on that in the chat as well. I think one of the, the biggest um, challenges and why I was so grateful that, that Steph, Kat and Hannah were willing to do this as part of their study is, is getting funding to support work like this. And I know there are many people on the call that are publishing ROEs, but for the reality, I think for most of us, practitioner, academic or not, it's sort of a, an add-on or I'll do it when I can. And you can almost see that play out when you look at the patterns of publications. Um, so, so that's the big one. The other one that I would personally love the AES to consider is to, um, the way that the US team has really facilitated a lot of this is having a TIG, a topical interest group, or an our language a special interest group as part of their association that is dedicated to research on evaluation. So that could be um, perhaps a more actionable implication that the association can consider. Um, and maybe that's something we can all be a part of. Those of us who are on the call who are clearly interested. But yeah, just having a structure so that we can actually be talking to each other and even just sharing not necessarily the load, but you know, the work of doing research in a more collaborative way, I think that would be great. Do you see the annual conference to be an opportunity to shed some more light on this whole area? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do. I, I'm sure that yeah, um, everyone else is nodding too. Yes, yes. We're, we're biased, but yes, we say definitely yes. We have we definitely see opportunities um, at the conferences uh, there as well for sure. Okay, uh, Katina, I'm in your hands. Yep. So about... thank you, everyone, and thank you so much for coming along. I think we've run over time as a testament of how rich a discussion we're having. I can already see people responding to the to the survey. Uh, thanks, John, for so definitely. Uh, um, uh, guiding us and shepherding us through the Q&A. Thank you everyone for your time this evening. Um, and it's been a pleasure uh, to share our, our, our work with you. And I think, yeah, like I said, we're very keen to keep this as an ongoing discussion. Uh, the few of us are probably gonna stay on for a bit more. So if you'd like to have um, a chat with us, uh, be very welcome to, but, other, but um, otherwise have a great evening and thank you again for your time.